So this is my research question, why and how people get involved in violence organisations. I was going to go through my background because this is actually what's brought me to DCU. Um, my experience abroad, I feel, gives me an operational perspective on violence organisations that's slightly different from the pure academic and I thought DCU was a good place to combine both. So I'm looking at, as I say, violence organisations. And what I mean by that is any organisation that uses violence as a part of its MO or goals. The research to date breaks them very much into terrorist groups, gangs, and the military. And very few combine all three groups. And from terrorist groups, a lot of them themselves don't want to be perceived to be equal or equivalent to gangs or criminals. And likewise, the military, I don't think, would like to see themselves in this comparison group. And getting involved, I mean anything from formal membership of signed um, allegiance like you or I would do to a library, or a supporter just like you or I would do for a band or a football team, for example. So they're the three things. And it is quite a unique thing that, to bring these three groups and compare them. And there's a reason why I want to do this, because if we look at terrorist groups, we hear the word radicalization. And to me, radicalization is one of the biggest myths of terrorism research, because there's no evidence to suggest just because you have uh, radical views that you have a higher chance of using violence. And you're probably common with, uh, uh, you probably are familiar with this term, but actually it's the process in today's uh, dialogue, it's the process by which people take on radical views and then move to violence. But as I say, this is today's uh, impression. In fact, I quote Martin Luther King when I say, not only am I standing here on the shoulders of giants with my research today, I am doing so because of, because of radicals and their commitment to their agenda. So, you know, I think most academics would say they're proud to have that radical streak in them. And this, so being radical isn't a bad thing, but in today's day and age, I think many people perceive it to be. And it's used today to isolate people, to push one group into the group we don't like and others to be in the group we do like. So I want to look at this from a very different perspective. So how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to compare these three groups because from what I'm looking at, although the research doesn't compare them very much, there's actually a lot to suggest that there's great similarities between them. And actually the use of language, so the use of terms like radicalization or extreme in this negative context are used to push people apart and not draw them together. So when you do actually look at the research, there's, out there, there's common, very little commonality in language, but there are commonalities in themes. For example, they, all three groups you enlist to in the most cases, you yourself make a choice to join, join it, gone are the days for most countries of conscription to the military. And most of them sell a dream. So for the IRA, it was a United Ireland. For the Irish, I don't know if you've seen recently, the Irish uh, military have released an interactive video which sells, like, join our team, I think is the hashtag. And they show this life of, you know, I am the soldier, I am macho. In Sweden, I think it's much more UN peacekeeping. Then they provide a sense of belonging, the brotherhood. We know from the Hollywood impression of gangs and stuff that this is a big thing, but the military also possess this. And an interesting one I found is called the redemption factor, or the way of saying sorry. ISIS are looking to recruit people that have used drugs or drink alcohol or have cr committed criminal acts and actually say this is a way of you saying sorry to God and doing well for the, your religious uh, order. And actually the military, interestingly enough, the US military and the British government are, are now actually uh, actively recruiting people with a criminal history and saying it's a way of saying sorry. It's actually because their numbers are reducing and they need to get bigger pools. But it's an, you know, it's an interesting dimension. So from what I'm finding is there's a lot of similarities in the recruitment. So why people are attracted to them and why not. And another interesting thing is people join all these groups not necessarily to use violence. So in the military you have engineers, you have pilots, it's in the, the, the Air Corps, but in the, in the um, uh, would say ISIS or groups like that, you could be a doctor, you could be logistics, you could be providing finance. But why is this important? Because I can imagine some of you are going, yes, but people are dying. Well, actually, a lot of the policies in reaction to radicalization or to de-radicalization. And if de-radicalization doesn't exist, well then we're wasting a lot of money on de-radicalization programs. And the evidence is su suggesting that it doesn't exist. 
So it is a waste of money. But for Ireland, we are at the cusp of having to make this decision. We're having to say, do we want to secure our communities? Is this what we want to do? And I want to show through my research that not only should we be doing it better, but that there are ways of doing it better. Thank you very much.